What? Who are you? That was my tree, you moron! Nobody touches it without my say-so! Nobody! Oh no, the talking egg is mad at me. Puny mortal. As payback, I challenge you to make a better version of my Can Crush Omatic. <laughs> See that? I bet you can't make this. Fine. Here's a can crushing device that I made a week ago. It uses an electromagnet. What? That's not a can crusher! That's a can sucker! Well, it crushes cans, doesn't it? I suppose the can crusher and the electromagnet do the same thing. Great! So they're both can crushers then, right? I guess. But I'm not happy about it. I don't know if any of you also experienced this, but when I was in kindergarten, we learned about something called the function machine. It has an input, an output, and a rule that gets applied. So, for example, for the plus three function machine, you would add three to whatever the input is, and that would be the output. If you put in four as the input, you would get seven as the output, and there would be different function machines for different functions. Of course, functions exist in both math and computer programming, but the application still remains the same. They take in some sort of input and yield some sort of output after processing them in some way. Now what if there was some type of math or programming language where functions were all that you could do? In fact, nothing would exist in this system other than functions. That sounds borderline unusable. For one, what would you apply the functions onto anyway? Other functions. I mean, in regular math, you can already apply functions to other functions. I mean, for f of x equals 3x plus 2 and g of x equals 4x minus 3, f of g of x would reduce to f of x with g of x substituted in for x, which ends up as 12x minus 7. Lambda Calculus, which was invented by Alonzo Church in 1936, is a mathematical system that is based entirely around functions. A function takes this form. Lambda x dot specifies that the following term is a function with x as the input argument. When this function is run, all instances of x will be replaced by the input. This y, meanwhile, is just a free expression in the function that doesn't do anything yet. So if we apply this function to the input z, then the x in the function gets replaced with z, leaving us with z, z, y. This reduction was also called a beta reduction, and they occur from left to right. Now, there is no more reducible lambda functions in this example, so everything has reduced to its simplest form. Hooray! So, uh, this doesn't really look like a programming language. It just looks like some alternative way of doing math. And yeah, lambda calculus existed before computers existed, but it's still a programming language. Wait, how? Before computers even existed? How? Well, a Turing machine is an abstract representation of a computer. Every computer, including the one you're using to watch this video instead of doing what you're supposed to be doing, is really just a Turing machine with a fancy coat of paint. A system that can simulate a Turing machine is considered Turing complete. Lambda calculus is Turing complete, and so are most other programming languages and all of the good ones. Since lambda calculus can calculate anything that any other programming language can, it gets to be considered a programming language. Uh, by that logic, Magic the Gathering also gets to be considered a programming language. Yes! But it's a card game. Who cares? Anyway, back to Lambda Calculus. By having a pair of functions set up like this, we can create a function that basically has two or more arguments, even though officially Lambda Calculus only has single argument functions. This is called currying. As a quick side tangent about the food curry, the world's hottest curry measures 6 million on the Scoville scale, is prepared by chefs wearing protective goggles, and the first person to finish it had to take breaks due to hallucinating. Because the curry is literally twice as spicy as pepper spray. And I struggle through bags of hot Cheetos. Anyway, this function here takes in two inputs and returns the first of the inputs. This other function, meanwhile, returns the second input. We can now give these functions completely random and arbitrary names, such as true and false. Hold on, do those actually work as booleans? Yes, they do. We can use the property that true selects the first input and false selects the second input to create all of the boolean operators that we all know and love. For example, the not function takes in one input, and that input is either true or false. 
The input, naturally, is a Boolean function that takes in two arguments. If we pass in a true as the input, we want to return false. So false would be the first argument passed into this input function. Likewise, true would be the second argument passed into the input function. So, when this function is reduced, it reduces to the opposite of the input. Provided that the input is already a Boolean function. The AND Boolean operator takes in two inputs as Boolean functions, x and y. If x is true, we want to return the result from y. But if x is false, the entire AND function must just return false. So false is the second input into x. Would work similarly, but the other way around. So if x is true, we would always return true. Otherwise, we'd return whatever y is. Yeah, that's right. Now that we have booleans in their operations, we can reduce any boolean expression we'd like using only functions. Also, here's a fun way to visualize lambda calculus using hungry alligators. It just fits too perfectly with my channel's reptile theme that developed somehow. Also, sometimes they change colors. That's called an alpha reduction, and it happens when a function or variable is renamed to prevent naming collisions. So, how would one do numbers in Lambda Calculus? I mean, if Lambda Calculus can simulate a Turing machine, and other computers can deal with numbers, then you must be able to deal with numbers in Lambda Calculus, right? Correct! In Lambda Calculus, numbers are represented by these things called church numerals. A church numeral is a function that takes in two arguments, f and x, and applies f as a function onto x a certain number of times. How many times this happens is the church numeral's value. So, f of f of x has a value of 2. The church numeral 0 is our base case, and it can just be defined like this. Some of you may have noticed that 0 and false are actually the exact same function. The next step, though, is to build the natural numbers by defining the successor function that produces the next number. This function takes in a church numeral as one function n. In the body of this function, it will replace n with whatever the church numeral is. The church numeral is itself a function, which will apply the following function f onto the variable x n times. This basically removes the lambdas from the initial numeral, replacing it with just the nesting functions, which are then placed inside of one more f. The output is a function with two arguments, and it's another church numeral, the one after the input. Using succession, we can define addition. Addition takes in two church numerals, a and b. Now again, a church numeral is applying a function onto a value n many times. So we want to apply the successor function a many times, starting at b. So if our inputs are church numerals representing 2 and 3, we will apply the successor function to 3 and do it two times. The end result will be a church numeral for 5. Hey look, that's what 2 plus 3 is. Using this, we can also define multiplication. For this, we want to add b to the result a many times, starting at 0. So it's defined like this. For 2 and 3 as inputs again, it will apply add 3 onto 0 twice, resulting in a 6. Okay, oh, hey, that's what 2 times 3 is. Now, using lambda calculus, you can perform all sorts of complex calculations. But, like our weird booleans and weird church numerals, they would all look pretty strange. But hey, you can do it, and that's what makes Lambda Calculus so cool. It can do anything that a Turing machine can, despite being defined in a way that is way simpler than defining a Turing machine. I mean, I probably couldn't even define the entirety of a Turing machine off the top of my head. But anyway, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time!